Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Gussick, and I am the Associate Curator for Anthropology at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. I've been embarking on a project, we've been working on it for about the past six years now, where we've been really, me and a number of my colleagues from a whole bunch of different universities, from La Brea Tar Pits, um, from Scripps Institution, and some federal agencies, have been really interested in trying to understand the submerged portions of the landscape on the Northern Channel Islands. So 75% of Santa Rosé, or the initial super island that was there 15,000 years ago, is now underwater. And we know that there were humans on that landscape at that time. So we're trying to understand the development of that landscape and how sea level rise impacted that, impacted habitats, impacted paleo channels, um, how, where were people located across this landscape, what kind of resources can we look for on the submerged landscape that can help us identify um, where people used to live and how they utilize this large island because we have really no idea at this point. So we've been embarking on this project for, as I mentioned, about six years now and what we're really focusing on is characterizing the underwater landscape. And so what this means is that we're using technology, submerged uh, technology that we put um, kind of into under the sea level, we go out on ships, we put technology that images below the seafloor and it images the top of the seafloor um, and it looks for all different kinds of resources on the seafloor and allows us to map everything. And then from those we can understand where paleo channels were located. So there's rivers that come off of the islands and how did sea level rise impact those courses? Because um, what we see right now is on land and we can assume where they went into the offshore, but we're not entirely sure. Um, we also need to understand how much marine sediment is on top of the terrestrial landscape that used to be above sea level. Um, so when we think about how much sea level's risen, we think the estimate is about 300 feet over the past 15,000 years, which is a ton. Um, but that's a little bit skewed because there's also a lot of marine sand that comes in with sea level rise. So we could have a meter of marine sand on top of a terrestrial surface. We could have 20 meters of marine sand on top of a terrestrial surface. And so that would um, affect what we view as the sea floor when we're looking at sea level rise. So we're trying to understand better where are the actual terrestrial landscapes and how do we get to them? And so some of the things we're looking for are watercourses, we're looking for old beaches, uh, old shorelines, uh, we're looking for areas that may have been productive like estuaries or um, different kinds of lacustrine environments, so these kind of brackish water environments that we know early peoples were really interested in. And so we take this imaging equipment from these boats that we use and we essentially drop them off on the back and we have a couple of them that measure a whole bunch of different um, variables within the ocean and within the seafloor. And one of the ones that we're using, which is a new piece of equipment that we've actually created with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, is something that looks for specifically hydrocarbons in, on the, uh, in the offshore areas. And what's really unique about this is we are working with a graduate student who actually developed a, a system that not only looks for hydrocarbons like tar seeps and things like that, but probably can also differentiate a, sh a buried shell midden underneath marine sand from buried rocks or a buried paleo channel, which we haven't previously been able to do with the sonar systems that we use. Um, so this is a pretty exciting thing. And what we're, what we're interested in in looking for these, say, tar seeps or rocks or, you know, um, different kinds of uh, shell deposits is that these are things that early peoples would have been attracted to. So in order to understand how they use that landscape, in order to understand where they would have settled or the uh, resources they would have used, we first need to understand the development of that landscape, where the resources were across that landscape. We essentially need to understand the paleo environment as it existed 15,000 years ago. So our project focuses a lot on understanding the geology of the island, understanding the ecology of the island. One project that we're doing now is trying to find tar seeps off there. And tar was something that was really important, um, not only ecologically, so it traps a whole bunch of information about the environment. It traps microfossils, it traps little bits of insects and pollen and all sorts of things that you can extract out of the tar to understand 
what that environment looked like at the time period that it was trapped in that tar. Um, but also tar was important from a cultural standpoint. So tar was used as a waterproofing agent, it was used as an adhesive. So anything, say, that you use tape for now, or anything that you waterproof now, you know, you're waterproofing your deck, all these things that you're doing, um, that's something that um, the Native Americans that were here would have used tar for. So they would have used tar to um, waterproof cooking vessels, to waterproof uh, water, uh, you know, water bottles, um, to waterproof boats and things like that. As an adhesive, they would use it to um, uh, take a, a projectile point, an arrowhead or a spear point, and actually affix it to a shaft, you know, an arrow shaft or a spear. So we find actually uh, this kind of a fix to it. They would also use it on fishing lines. So fishing was a really, really, you know, uh, uh, a very important aspect to the daily life of people that lived on the Northern Channel Islands. And we've actually found fishing implements that still have tar, fish hooks, shell fish hooks and things that still have tar on them from where they were kind of attaching lines made out of seagrass to kind of shell fish hooks. So those are things that can help us understand not only the paleo environment first, but then also understanding where across the landscape may people have settled and what environments were they using during that time period. And that will then help us think of, well, where do we look for these early sites in the submerged environment? Because that's really a big challenge because there is the Northern Channel Islands alone 200 square kilometers of land that was above sea level when people first got there that's now underwater. So where on that landscape do we look? And that's why we need to understand what that landscape looked like in the first place. So that's really what the project's been focusing on. And we've um, been able to work with uh, marine geologists, marine biologists, marine geophysicists, um, our, our tribal partners, um, and lots of different people are involved in this to help us really understand this problem. So it's a really great uh, project that really shows how interdisciplinary sciences and how, how when you get this interdisciplinary team together we can really have some interesting and, um, and good science come out of it. One of the big questions about these early habitations um, in what's now kind of North and South America is how did people get here first of all that's one of the big things that people want to ask and also how early were they here so that's another uh, big question so this kind of research can really help understand the timing perhaps of a coastal migration into the new world which is a really interesting topic for um, just kind of understanding the development of human history within this area um, ideally it can also help to understand how do people get there so we know the islands were never attached to the mainland so they had to have gotten there by a boat but we don't have any evidence of these early boats. What's interesting about that is that the things like wood and these kinds of materials typically in archaeological sites degrade um, over time. Um, but what's interesting about an environment in a submerged environment is that things like that can, not always, but can be better preserved than in an open air environment above sea level because they, if they get covered with um, sediment and then they're essentially in an oxygen deprived environment. Um, so they can actually survive better. So we may even be able to find something interesting like that. I have colleagues doing some underwater archaeological research that have found things like um, paddles, canoe paddles, and things like that from thousands and thousands of years ago that have preserved. Um, so I think that's one important aspect of it. And also everything we know about how people um, use the landscape and how they lived is really based on what we understand about the kind of early Holocene and going into the terminal Pleistocene, but right during that time period, there was a lot of sea level rise, there was change in climate, there was this really, really massive upheaval in the environment. Um, and we don't really know a lot about how people best responded to that. So we understand when people got there, but it was shortly after that that they were really experiencing and having to adapt to this massive change in their environment. I mean, similar to today. Um, and so that's something that we want to understand better and in order to do that, we need to understand that environment. And so that's something else I think that this research can help answer too, is understanding how people do respond or how, you know, granted these are much smaller, um, you know, groups of people than we have now, for instance, but, you know, how do people respond to um, these massive changes in their environment in terms of sea level rise, in terms of shifting environments, um, you know, and having their, their, all their habitats that they were used to kind of drastically changing. Intertidal habitats moving to subtidal, completely different species live within those areas. So that's something else I think that this research can really focus on as well, is understanding that change and that really big kind of climatic change that occurred during that particular time period. And 
ideally provide some sort of deep time understanding for us now to be able to look back and to see, you know, how did people adapt to these changes or how did species adapt to these changes, not just human species, but all biological species. How did they adapt to these changes through time and kind of what does that mean moving forward into the future when we do have these kinds of major climactic events occurring kind of moving forward. Why people migrate is another really big question within anthropology. So we know that there was lots of migrations around this time period. So between about 20,000 years ago, you know, we're at the 25,000 years ago, we're at the height of the glacial period. So glaciers are at the height of they were during the last ice age. Um, and we know that there is movement around. So why did people decide to move? Why did people move during this particular time period? Were they moving because of some sort of push factor that there was, they were following migrations of animals, there wasn't a lot of food in the area that they were at. Um, so understanding why people migrate is also interesting. And in this area, you know, the glaciers at the last ice age didn't actually cover the Channel Islands and they didn't actually come go over to the coast in some of these areas. And they didn't go to the kind of the southern part of, you know, what is now the, the North America. Um, so were people trying to get away from the kind of colder glaciers in the northern areas and maybe following, you know, migrations of sea mammals? You know, we're not 100% sure, but there's a lot of theories about that. Um, some of the early sites that we do have on the island show a lot of hunting technology and they are in areas where we know um, from historic and also current records there are lots and lots of sea mammals, lots of kind of sea lions, elephant seals and things like that. So, you know, in, when they were first migrating, is that why? Um, so these are, I think, a lot of the questions that we may be able to maybe not answer. It's kind of hard to, you know, definitively answer questions sometimes like that, um, but at least provide a lot more data to understand better, um, you know, what and create different theories as to why people were migrating and also why they chose the Channel Islands. I mean, I have my theories. It's an absolutely wonderful place. It's so productive. Um, it has giant kelp forests that really harbor lots and lots of marine life. It's they're really, really a hot spot in terms of um, biological diversity, uh, biodiversity. So it seems like really an ideal place if you're looking for um, you know, a new home, you're looking for a place to sustain your family. I mean, really, I don't think you can find a much, much better spot than, in my opinion. Whenever I say that I do underwater archaeology, a lot of people, I think, imagine me putting on a scuba suit and a scuba tank and, you know, kind of diving. And that is definitely part of it. But the underwater work that we're doing now is all on a ship, all on boats, on ships. Um, and as I mentioned, all kind of, you know, using this equipment that images the seafloor. And it can be pretty grueling, for sure. Um, this last project that we were on, uh, we went out and our days are typically 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 hour days. Uh, we go out on the ship for quite a long time. You have to transit out there, drop in the equipment, monitor things the whole time, uh, and then pull it up, make sure everybody's safe, um, monitor weather, monitor for mammals. We have to shut down some equipment if we see marine mammals in the area because we're using some um, sonar that we want to make sure that we don't um, interfere with any um, kind of any mammals. Uh, sea mammals, so um, it can be pretty grueling. Um, sometimes we have ships large enough that we stay on the ships, and those uh, tend to be a little bit better, I think, because you don't have to kind of transit back and forth, but typically when we stay on a ship, we'll do 24-hour operations. So we'll split into teams, and we have you know, one team working from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. and another team working from 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. And so those are actually pretty interesting and fun. Sometimes when you're on the 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. shift, it's it's pretty grueling, but it's really pretty at the same time. Being out in the ocean, just pitch black with you know deck lights on the back, um, kind of doing doing whatever work you're doing. So um, it's it's nice, and it's it's really nice to uh, be with a great team of people. Um, I work with a lot of female scientists as well, which is wonderful. At one point when we were on the ship, the entire crew was all women, which we were very proud about, um, all female scientists. So um, it's really been a, a wonderful project, and like I said, very interdisciplinary. I've learned so much from my colleagues in geology and biology and marine geophysics, my marine geophysicist colleagues, just understanding better um, the environment, understanding better the, uh, the landscape and how to understand um, and this kind of science really benefits me as an archaeologist because those are all things I need to understand um, because humans adapt to the environment, humans adapt to the landscape and so I need to understand that landscape to understand human behavior on that landscape.
The tribal communities um, that are here today have ancestors that actually um, lived on the islands. Um, so unfortunately, the islands now are restricted for habitation, with the exception of uh, Catalina Island in the southern channel, in the southern um, island group. Um, so the Northern Channel Islands where I work is the ancestral territory of the Shumash. Um, so the Shumash are uh, traditionally from roughly kind of Malibu, north up to San Luis Obispo, um, and also on the Northern Channel Islands. And so any projects that we do, whether they're underwater projects, whether they're you know, on the mainland, uh, whether they're on the islands themselves, um, it's, a, it's a, an important part of the project is to make sure that we are working with the tribes and partnering with tribal individuals and ideally people that have ancestry to the specific areas you're working with. Um, and the reason for that is because while I'm an archaeologist and I can understand specific things about archaeology and things about, you know, archaeological sites and maybe things about, um, you know, the physical locations on landscapes, um, what is really important and is another line of kind of knowledge in this is tribal knowledge and that's something that I don't possess. Um, so that's something just like I talk to my marine geology colleagues about what they know and kind of come together on um, that tribal knowledge is really important as well. Um, and it's kind of on par with what we're doing from a scientific standpoint. So understanding that is um, something that is very beneficial not only for our understanding um, but then we also try to share the kind of um, intricacies and the complexity of some of the, the equipment that we're using so these tribal communities can kind of understand um, you know what's what's happening in their tra ancestral territories um, so this last project we actually had um, uh, we have three um, Native American participants um, on the project that are part of the crew that came out two of them were able to come out onto the ships with us which is really great um, and provided lots of uh, information about you know, where, you know, the kind of, um, the native histories and the ideas of um, seafaring and ideas of um, resource gathering um, that they've been, they know and that's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And those are things that we don't know and we can't know. So um, information that they're able to share with us, some information can be private, um, but information they are willing to share with us um, is just so beneficial to the project. Um, and I think, again, makes for a much better project because we're thinking about multiple lines of of discovery, multiple lines of evidence, multiple lines of knowledge, and that just makes projects stronger.